compared to the problems those people have. <laughs> uh, well, that's it. And I'd Hello, everyone. Uh, I uh, would. Uh, I'm going to begin yes, now. So, if those of you are still coming in, please take your seats. We're going to start. Um, my name is Roger Purcell. Uh, and I am a faculty member here at Hunter College in the biology department. Uh, tonight, it's my pleasure to serve as the moderator for a panel of experts on staying sharp. The fact that you're all here sitting down means that you are certainly taking steps to stay sharp already. And we're going to talk, a lot. you may not think so, but you are. Uh, we're going to talk about... Sorry. Uh, the, the normal brain, uh, the aging brain, what we, can, uh, what we may fa might face uh, when the brain doesn't work as well as we would like it to, and what we can do to keep it right. Uh, before I begin, and before our panel introduces itself, uh, we'd like to thank the institutions and the organizations that have made this afternoon's panel discussion possible. Uh, AARP, not inappropriately, the MetLife Foundation, the Dana Foundation for Brain Initiatives, and of course, Hunter College, a very great resource to the Upper East Side and the New York City community. Good. Um, I'd also like to uh, mention that uh, this is Brain Awareness Week, something I was unaware of until <laughs> fairly recently. Uh, the Staying Sharp program is part of this uh, week part of Brain New York, B-R-A-I-N-Y, New York's first collaborative Brain Awareness Week campaign. Um, I'm going to let the panel introduce itself, each member, our, uh, our experts, and uh, then we will begin. What, we, what I would like to do right now, though, is to please ask you to hold off questions, of which I expect you to have many, until the end and then we will try to address all of them. May I? I think you're on. I think so, you were. I don't know. I don't know. Is your light on? No. Oh my. Yeah, that's when I put that on it, that's when I got feedback. So Hello? Okay. Uh, there you okay. go. No, yeah, that's probably. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Dr. Uh, Ann Ganser, and I am an assistant professor here at Hunter College um, in the Department of Nursing. And um, I teach the graduate students, um, the psychiatric nurse practitioners. Um, I have uh, been practicing nursing for about uh, 25 plus years, and I have worked in a variety of different settings. Um, primarily in um, aging and dementia and Alzheimer's centers at NYU, at Downstate in Brooklyn, and I am also a postdoctoral fellow at the Veterans Administration, where I do research on healthy brain aging and stroke and how we can um, work with older adults who have had uh, transient ischemic attacks or TIAs uh, to recover quickly. So I'm going to pass this over. Hi, I'm Charles Mobs. Uh, I'm a professor of neuroscience, endocrinology, and geriatrics at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And I've been studying aging for over 30 years. And um, my basic focus is what I call the metabolic mystery, which is the observation that, as we know, and we'll talk about more today, uh, certain risk factors like diabetes and obesity are uh, basically very toxic to a lot of uh, the organs. And on the other hand, dietary restriction, which means about 30, eating 30% fewer calories than you otherwise would eat, is extremely protective. And this is very mysterious because we don't understand why that should be the case. So uh, I'm trying to understand how that works because dietary restriction is protective against basically all age-related diseases. So including cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and everything. I'm not recommending anyone in this room undergo dietary restriction. We, uh, we just want to figure out how it works so we can put it in a pill. So, uh, <laughs> and I actually worked very closely with Dr. Jack Rowe, uh, who was one of the first people to s formulate the uh, concept of successful aging. So I'm a bit of a proponent. All right, let's uh, begin, please. 
Welcome. Uh, let's begin by taking a look at the normal brain, sort of lay the groundwork there. And uh, I, I think I'll ask uh, Dr. Mobs to do that. Okay, I got the microphone. Might as well, right? Right. So, um, as you all know, basically the brain is where it's at for human beings. Uh, so it, it basically supports lots of different functions. One of the functions that we'll be talking about today a lot, of course, is memory. Uh, but we shouldn't forget all the other functions that the brain uh, supports as well uh, that are equally important, if not really more important, like consciousness, uh, emotion, uh, calculation, imagination, love. And all those things really arise from this very mysterious organ in, in the brain. And, uh, of course, uh, again, as you all know, how does it do that? And it basically does it by the connections between uh, one particular cell type called the neuron, which is kind of the business end of the, uh, the brain, but that's supported by other types of cells too, especially glial cells. So it's really the health of the neurons that's really the key uh, point. And uh, another key point uh, that, you, that you probably know as well is that different parts of the brain support different functions. So the part of the brain that supports memory function uh, is a part in the middle of the brain called the hippocampus. Which, but that talks to the sort of thinking part of your brain called the cortex, uh, and unfortunately, those are exactly the two parts of the brain that are most devastated by Alzheimer's disease. So another part of your brain uh, called the basal ganglia supports movement, and not surprisingly, I guess, unfortunately, uh, that is the part of the brain that's most devastated by Parkinson's disease and also Huntington's disease. So uh, we don't really understand why that happens, but that at least explains why we get those particular symptoms. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, one of the questions that, that may crop up has to do with um, gender and aging. Do men and women <coughs> age differently? Do they have different issues as they age? Uh, People who uh, see other members of the other genders may notice differences, or they may not. We'll see. Um, Anne, do you want to, Dr. Ganser? <coughs> you want me to speak to the gender, gender. difference? Ge well, in general, I think you know we know that women uh, tend to outlive men, and um, that's also a mystery, right? Why do we, why do women um, outnumber men, um, and? Uh, as we age now and our population is, is really growing, and I'm sure that's why so many of you are coming out here today, because the expectancy um, of, of, of your longevity has really risen. Um, maybe around 1900, the life expectancy was around 47 years of age. And in the year 2000, it's now up to 78, and it's progressing. And so, um, there's going to be a lot more women out there. What can we do to help um, you uh, maintain that longevity? And that's what we're here about to talk about tonight. And uh, how can we put things in place to help uh, the guys stick around? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dr. Ganser, is there a difference between the, the, the mental faculties of men and women as they age? All right, yeah, I'll uh, address that point. Uh, probably a lot of you have heard that uh, a lot more women get Alzheimer's disease than men, uh, which is true. But uh, although we don't entirely understand why that is, in my opinion, it's almost entirely just because women live longer than men. And uh, Alzheimer's disease is clearly, obviously, a disease of the aged. So in terms of almost any other uh, respect that uh, one could imagine, uh, women, you know, basically are superior to men as far as I can tell. <laughs> so uh, so, so there, otherwise there's not really uh, any major gender effect. I will bring up though the point which I'm sure many of you have heard uh, about whether estrogen replacement therapy therefore might be useful uh, for women uh, against Alzheimer's disease. And, and you probably heard that the, there were a lot of trials that looked at this question, seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, basically, at the moment, the consensus is no estrogen replacement therapy is not in any way helpful for cognitive function or for um, Alzheimer's disease as you get older. Uh, that's the consensus. There's some people that are still ho hoping something can come of it, but for the, for the time being, the clinical recommendation is uh, do not use hormone replacement therapy for cognitive impairments. 
I, I want to add a little complexity here. Uh, it turns out that more men get Parkinson's disease than women. So it, it, these kinds of changes that occur with aging are not simple. And as uh, you'll hear many, many times tonight, it's, no one really knows why. But there are differences uh, in how the two genders age, maybe with respect to susceptibility to some illnesses, some brain dysfunction. But otherwise, I think we're probably on agreement that uh, as long as you're staying healthy, the distinctions are trivial or not even in existence. One of the issues with aging that uh, we all face, certainly, as, as well as you, is memory. I think it probably worries us uh, as much as any specific disease. And indeed, one of the first things is, well, my memory is going, do I have Alzheimer's? My memory is going, do I, uh, am I too old? What's, what's going on? Memory is often the first flag for us and probably generates more worry than anything else. Can uh, either of you talk about uh, the nature of memory and what we can expect normally and maybe uh, with some suspicion as we get older? Okay, all right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, th this comes up a lot. And so I just want to make a, f a few kind of comments on this point. Uh, first of all, it's very important to distinguish between Alzheimer's disease and what happens if you don't have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, because basically, Alzheimer's disease, of course, is a horrible uh, disease and it's devastating, and memory impairments is one of, of many uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and not necessarily mm -hmm. even the worst, certainly not the, not the earliest, uh, but it's, uh, that's a devastating disease. If you don't have Alzheimer's disease, th there will be, with, as with all the rest of your physiological functions, some impairments in memory function as you get older. But really, they're very, very minor. And in fact, uh, they are so minor on the whole that at most they're an inconvenience uh, and very likely you wouldn't even notice them, but unfortunately as we get older, we get sort of paranoid about Alzheimer's disease, so we get this confirmation bias. Oh, I must have Alzheimer's because I forgot where my keys were. Well, I forgot where my keys were when I was 20 years old also. So uh, there is one thing that's kind of particularly annoying and particularly common, which is the tip of the tongue phenomenon. I'm sure we've all experienced that. Uh, you just, there's a word you know, and you just can't come up with it 10 minutes later, you get it. So very common, very annoying. It does increase with age, uh, but by and large, not really physiologically significant. So um, the important thing is to not get panicky, and especially don't get panicky about your relatives uh, just because they are not being able to come up with, uh, you know, with a word or something like that. Uh, as we'll talk about more, there are many, many reasons to be optimistic as you get older that you can really retain all your marbles. Uh, so uh, th th I think the name of the game here is don't overreact to relatively minor symptoms. You know, we, we all have been victimized by a lot of cliches that probably go back thousands of years. And one of the most dogged ones, if I may use that uh, pun here, is that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And uh, the, the, the thought is that, well, we're getting older, we're losing some function, maybe memory, and we're stuck with that. And I think you're hearing already the first indications that we're not stuck with that and that you can teach anybody at any age new things. So one of the aspects of that learning process uh, it comes under the general idea of brain plasticity, something that uh, we tend to think of perhaps as being characteristic of the young, but it turns out it's characteristic of human beings, period. Uh, Dr. Ganser? Um, <clears throat> it, was, it was a fallacy that we've, we've um, had for many years that the brain, you know, we, we, we thought that the brain could no longer change. When you, you became a certain age, uh, you couldn't develop any more neurons. That was it. It was over. And it was only going backwards. You were losing neurons as time went on. Um, you know, we used to call it senile dementia, right? You know, oh, that person's senile. And you go to a nursing home and they were sitting there. And, you know, a lot of times they weren't really senile. They were bored. 
they were just sitting there bored and they were looking out into space. No one was engaging them. Uh, they were perhaps uh, depressed because when you get to a certain age, you've lost perhaps your significant other, things have changed, and you are no longer fitting into that life that you once knew. Well, the new thought is change is good. We need to change. Change with the times. So we need to learn to embrace the changes that occur with each decade of our life. And as we get to 50, 60, 70, and over, we need to think about things that we can do to enhance our brains and make our brains think differently. So, for instance, I like to use the example of, you know, you, 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 you're right-handed, and you're, your whole life you're right-handed. Well, you know what? Change hands. You know, use your left hand to comb your hair and brush your teeth. That stimulates neurogenesis in the brain. Now the brain has to think, what are you doing? You're not using your right hand anymore to brush your teeth. Okay, so those are the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about this evening. What can you do now to help make those neurons start reproducing? One uh, aspect of memory and brain plasticity and learning, indeed, and one of the reasons that, that we often do fear the loss of that is that, let's face it, many of us don't always get a good night's sleep. And it's turning out that a good night's sleep is uh, a necessary requirement. It may not be the same as it was when you were 14, sleeping 14 hours a day. But uh, it, it is something that we will also address later on. I wanted to jump to it briefly now because it is linked to successful uh, learning and memory retention and uh, successful brain plasticity. All right, well, let's uh, talk a little bit uh, more. There are some changes with memory uh, that do accompany age. Um, what, what, uh, what can we expect? Are there any differences? It's just, just maybe the word is on the tip of my tongue and nothing more? Well, or is there something more? No, there, there's something more. Um, and so, for example, if anybody here has recently played uh, the game memory or concentration with a five or six year old. Uh, I don't know if you've done that, but uh, you probably, if you have done that, and that's the way that game works is you put down cards, you look at them, then flip them over, and then basically you have to remember where they were before. And uh, most of you probably will have found that your five year old uh, niece or granddaughter probably beat the pants off of you. Uh, and that's a well established phenomenon that that kind of memory. It's also the same kind of memory uh, that you use to memorize lists, for example, uh, absolutely starts declining daily, weekly, yearly from around the age of 17 on. Uh, and, and it monotonically, constantly. Uh, so that uh, if you had a room of uh, teenagers and a, and a room of not teenagers, older people, and you had a list of 15 words, and you have five minutes to list uh, to memorize those words, and then ten minutes later you come back. Unquestionably, the teenagers would be absolutely far better than the group of seniors. But I ask you, how important is that really in your daily life? It just doesn't come up that much. Uh, and for example, uh, I, as, as a hobby of mine, is I'm an actor, and so I have to memorize a lot of lines. Believe me, it has gotten a lot harder as I've gotten older. But you know what? I compensate, I cope, but as far as my day-to-day -day life, I'm a scientist. Do I really need to be able to memorize lists? No, I've got the internet, so do you. So uh, basically, these are, these are easy, to do, these kinds of problems are easy, I, mean, I shouldn't call them problems, these kinds of age-related changes are easy to demonstrate in the laboratory, they're very robust, but they really don't mount to a hill of beans, in my opinion. Well, should older people, should uh, we, uh, pay attention to these losses that you're saying no, but um, you know, when you say, my God, I saw a movie last week, I have no idea what the name of it was, and everybody's looking at me like I'm the, uh, I've been there. the old jerk here in the room, you know? Uh, is there something we could be doing that just kind of keeps us a little bit more vibrant? Um, you know, just 
not necessarily crossword puzzles. As people have said, if you do crossword puzzles, it makes you good at crossword puzzles. But <laughs> are, are there, what, well, let's maybe this is the first chance we can uh, have of talking about some of the things we might want to engage in that uh, are good with respect to memory. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm sure all of you have seen all these new programs that they have on television, right? Uh, they're constantly running Luminosity and <laughs> Cognifit, and there's all these different new programs. They're actually trying to um, get into your deep pockets because they know baby boomers have lots of money. You've been saving that for years and years. So they're targeting you with your worst fear. Your memory is going. And now, here it is. They're flashing it on the screen. This is all you have to do is engage in our games and your memories will improve. Well, there is some science to it. It's not just advertisement. There is some science that if you engage in new kinds of novel activities that, again, the, the issue of neuroplasticity and the brain mapping out new pathways will begin to happen. But you don't have to go out and spend $500 on one of these programs in order to do that. There are other things that you can do that are very simple as long as they're different. And that's really, I think, from what I take away from this message. As long as they're different from what you have done in your routine life. So let's say you're going on a trip to France and you want to learn a new language. You want to be able to have conversational French when you get there. Well, that will help you learn because it's something new to you and to the way your brain has been thinking. Um, you can, um, you know, engage in other kinds of activities. If, you've, if you're a real big crossword puzzle doer, well, that's not going to help because you've been doing that. But if you like to do something different, change it to Sudoku. You know, those are the kinds of things that I would recommend to um, help with successful aging uh, and keeping your brain sharp. There's one last question we're going to talk about in this section before we move on to an another section. Uh, many people in this group, uh, certainly people I know and my, among my friends, have very aged parents still alive, 105 years old, and they've got children whose own children are facing stress. And so many people in this room may find themselves to be in a um, almost a peak of stress. All life is stressful, but, but uh, so for some it's uh, more than, uh, than at other times in our lives. Is there a contribution that stress makes or is there some way to help cope with that uh, as we get older? Because well, okay, so nobody likes to feel stress, and uh, so th already, you know, we have sort of automatic alarms that go off when we're in a stressful situation. Uh, and there's some, there certainly is some evidence that un under at least extreme stress, uh, that that can, that can certainly cause problems for normal brain functioning. Uh, certainly it's distressing, it's d distracting, and uh, there are some some of the physiological responses to stress, like elevated stress hormone, uh, can certainly cause damage to the brain if, uh, if it's extreme enough. Um, but on the other hand, uh, and, and basically what we'll be talking about in terms of lifestyle interventions, many of the things that we, we will be talking about will actually also help you uh, cope with that stress. Uh, but uh, I don't think there's anything, sp certainly, you know, people say aging is not for sissies, and so there's going to be a lot of things that we, that we face. Uh, but I guess what I would say, in, in my view, uh, the interventions that we will be discussing today, although they're really specifically targeted for successful aging, the fact is they will all help you cope with stress also better. Okay, before we ultimately get to these uh, various things we keep telling you we're going to talk about, uh, we do want to address probably some of the big names in the kinds of, with the kinds of um, disorders that many of the people we know may suffer from. Uh, Alzheimer's was mentioned, Parkinson's has been mentioned, uh, stroke, um, or, uh, and, and dementia, uh, which is a kind of a general word. And one of the things that I 
personally am curious about from our experts is, uh, are, is there a range of these conditions or is someone normal one day and then they've got disaster the next and that's it? Is it always uh, yes or no? Or are we all coping with a variety of little different things uh, all the time? So let's talk about some of the diseases <coughs> that okay, we can well, face. There were many, many diseases and many diseases that affect the brain. Um, of course, we're all talking about Alzheimer's disease because that's been the hot topic for a long time now because we haven't been able to find an answer and we don't have an answer yet at this time. Uh, but dementia is, a, is, a, is an umbrella term and um, the diseases that cause dementia fall under this large umbrella. And Alzheimer's is just one type of dementia. There are many, many different types. Well, not that many, but there are many. So stroke can cause a dementia-like condition. Stroke is caused by modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Um, for instance, high blood pressure hyper, uh, or hypertension, um, diabetes, um, which we have medications to treat, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, alcohol. Those are all kinds of risk factors for stroke. And those kinds of risk factors cause what's considered white matter disease. They cause these little tiny, tiny strokes in your brain. And that can cause dementia, albeit a, a temporary one. It just kind of comes and then it goes. So it's like, I remember my mom calling me up one day and she said, you know, I just couldn't get the words out all morning. I could not get my words out. And I said, mom, you probably had what's called a transient ischemic attack, which is just a small, tiny little blood clot in the brain. And then it just, it just uh, dissipates um, over a short period of time. And then the brain is reperfused and now she can think straight. So better get to the hospital and you know get checked out right away. That's really important because we know from the science that if you have little tiny strokes, a lot of times you're you're setting yourself up for that big full-blown stroke. Now talking about the the other kinds of dementias, you know there are dementias called Jakob Crutzfeld disease. There are dementias called Lewy body dementia, and they're all causing memory loss. And, but they all have different kinds of symptoms and they come on differently. So in Alzheimer's disease, the course is extremely slow and insidious. You start to have little bouts of memory loss and then over time, it gradually increases and increases and increases. So the characteristics of the different types of disease processes are very, very different. So you know, the only dementia that I could think of would be like a, a stroke related that comes on really quick. You know, I mean, you could probably talk about it, some of that. Um, most of the disorders are slow and insidious and they don't, um, they don't just, you know, wham, you wake up the next day and you can't think anymore. Uh, uh, I, I would just add one thing because, because uh, I, uh, it is true that, that the dementias are associated with memory loss, but the the clinical presentation of dementias is completely different from just uh, the kinds of memory loss that most of us will deal with. In particular, uh, it, they're basically pretty early on in the course of the disease, there are kind of disorientations that occur that just don't occur to normal people. So, for example, you forget the season. You wind up in a store and you have no idea why, you, well, that could happen, I guess, to anybody. But, uh, uh, so, uh, but, but cr crazy things, really, that just are completely out of the ordinary for a normal person. So until those kinds of really strange things happen, you really shouldn't start wondering whether your memory loss is a precursor to Alzheimer's disease, because most likely it's not. Uh, but if you get some of these crazy, really strange orientation issues, Either, either in yourself or your spouse or a loved one, uh, that's a time when you might want to think about uh, talking to a doctor to get a diagnosis. But until then, it's probably harmless. 
Yeah, I'd like to feed off. Oh, I have a <laughs> microphone. I'd like to feed off that point just uh, a little bit because we are talking about successful aging, and I think one of the characteristics I know I have faced with dealing with younger people, whether they're family members or strangers, is the judgment that young people often uh, levy our ways, uh, maybe our own children, and. Uh, and they often are the ones who first say, oh, you've, you've got Alzheimer's exactly. disease. You are getting older. You're over the hill. Uh, what's wrong with you? And, and it can really have a, a, a terrible effect on an older person. Um, can, can you recommend something uh, to do with how do you cope with intergenerational conversation when the topic is your own insecurities and your own uh, behaviors that that might suggest dementia or decline is this is a complicated question but but is there a way to do that well I think it's about relationships and um, when you are um, in a situation with perhaps a spouse or you know a, a younger you know your child um, and, you know, it's, it's about having a conversation and, you know, they may notice something and that's very often how it begins. Um, you know, a, a spouse may notice, um, I had a patient once and the spouse called me up and said, you know, my husband put the milk in the pantry. I mean, and that was like a huge red flag because the milk doesn't belong in the pantry. Um, this this is a very unusual occurrence. So that alerted me, and I, you know I said, you really need to have him checked out. And so, but I think the the thing is to be honest and have a, a good frank conversation. If you're, you know, we get into the heat of it, and you say, oh, you have Alzheimer's disease. Well, you know, maybe what do you mean by that? Did you notice something that I'm doing that perhaps makes you think that? And ask your son or your daughter or your spouse. You know, we're often very afraid to, um, to tackle this issue. It may be nothing. It may be absolutely nothing. But it may be something that if, you know, that is treatable. There are things that are treatable. Um, we don't often talk about infectious disease and infectious processes. Very often I'll have a, a family member call me up and say, my father, he is so disoriented and confused. I don't know what to do with him. He was fine yesterday, and today he's so disoriented. And I say, well, maybe he's got a urinary tract infection, or maybe he has a respiratory tract infection. Infectious processes can cause a delirious kind of um, behavior in, in people. So we need to get at the root of what's going on first um, and, and really not be, I think, fearful of, of what you're encountering. Just a couple of points I would add. Uh, one is that what you're doing right now is really the best thing you can do in a situation like this. Be uh, educated probably more educated than they are because you're more concerned about it than they are. So if somebody accuses you of something, you can come back and say, you know, just say the things that, that we're talking about t tonight, that most, most of these kinds of very minor uh, occurrences really in, in no way indicate Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the other point, uh, there was one other kind of um, sort of avoidable or even reversible kind of dementia uh, that wasn't mentioned and it just occurred to me, which is medicines. There are a number of medicines that can actually cause the kind of confusion and dementia-like uh, symptoms that really look a lot like Alzheimer's disease. You go on a different medicine and they disappear. So geriatricians are particularly sensitive to this kind of thing. They know about those kinds of side effects, um, which are ac certainly more, pro uh, more uh, common in the elderly than in the young people. And of course, elderly people are more likely to be on those medicines anyway. So. Uh, that's, so one thing along those lines is uh, certainly you, you don't want to have just a standard uh, primary care physician try to make a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease because uh, a, a geriatrician or somebody like that would be in a much better position to figure out maybe if some of these medicines are interacting that cause uh, some of this confusion. 
One last comment also is depression. Um, yes. Sometimes we're depressed, and when we're depressed, we start to forget. And if we then um, get at the root cause of the depression, very often we can reverse the confusion and um, you know normalize the person again. So again, there's different things that are going on, and they, they all mimic the same kinds of symptoms, and we need to know what what the root cause is, really. Uh, I'm going to actually segue right back to depression, but first I want to make a, a, a brief point that um, Parkinson's disease, which uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, can be associated with a dementia, uh, often with a little bit more advanced Parkinson's, but not necessarily uh, the, the, the devastating end stage, but, but even just a, a bit, bit more advanced. Um, but we all face a variety of things as we get older, whether it's an arthritic hip uh, that can lead you to feel somewhat down and blue and depressed. <coughs> and um, as Dr. Ganser said, certainly uh, the depression uh, has an impact on our cognitive function, our, our sharpness, the very topic of tonight's uh, or today's uh, talk. And when you're not so sharp, everything starts to roll downhill and certainly to the outside world and even to close family members, it, we can look a little bit demented. So depression is a, a topic uh, worthy of its own discussion right now. What, what, what might cause it? How do we cope with it? Um, there are certainly enough commercials on television uh, <laughs> right along with the, uh, the learning tricks and the learning uh, 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 programs that uh, you would think depression is big business. Well, I guess it is big business. Um, so what what is it? Is everyone depressed? Is is uh, is it possible just to be sad for a day without being depressed, or or what? What are we looking at here? Well, when we think about our our mood, our mood fluctuates, right? Our, <coughs> every day, you know, some days we have good days, some days we have bad days. With depression, you want to look at the duration. How long have you been sad and blue? Okay, the, what's the window of time that you've been experiencing? And how is it affecting your daily life? Um, are you un, you know, how's your, your diet? Are you eating well? Or are you just not eating at all? Um, how's your sleep? Are you sleeping? Uh, are you sleeping too much? Or do you have insomnia? You know, are you up all night pacing the floors. So again, it's going to be the duration of how long this mood disorder is lasting. And that's going to tell us a lot about whether it's a chronic in depression um, or a major depressive disorder, or whether it is something that's seasonal, right? We've all heard of seasonal affective disorder. I often wonder, why do I live in New York City? It's always so dark and gloomy, and we've had such a bad winter been so cold, that can make you depressed. I get depressed. I walk around the city and I'm like, oh, where's the sunshine? Right? That gives us a little boost in our, in our affect. We feel great when we see the sun. So again, however, the duration, how long? Is, is it a situational depression? You know, did you just lose somebody in your life? Okay. It's normal to feel like that, but if it lasts for six months, then we're starting to worry what's going on. Well, I would just emphasize that um, I, I'm a little ambivalent about uh, diagnosing al Alzheimer's disease, to tell you the truth, because frankly, there's nothing we can do about it. And so it's kind of a definitely a two-edged sword. In contrast, depression is eminently treatable. And it's, the, the drugs out there are really so good, and this is, I mean, they're right to put it on TV, because um, it's eminently treatable in the vast majority of cases, which I think clearly indicates that it's biological in origin. Uh, and so in this case, you know, be better to seek treatment sooner rather than later. I, I think some of us macho guys feel like, you know, well, you know, what can a psychiatrist tell me? I can get my act together. But really, it's a biological disease, and it's, it's a disease that needs to be treated, uh, well, with the combination of talk therapy, but certainly drugs as well. And um, it, don't, don't uh, hesitate to seek out medical attention in, in exactly the kind of 
I don't know if you want to even go three months, I mean six months, because there's a kind of a real difference uh, between uh, major depression and any kind of reaction you have to any life event. It's really more, much more profound. And uh, if you really are feeling like you don't want to get out of bed, you don't want to live, this is not a reaction to a situation. It's a biological response, which is very dangerous, and it can be treated. We'll uh, talk just uh, about a couple of more um, abnormalities, let's say, that, uh, that we, we could face uh, and uh, then move on to successful aging. Uh, one of them that has been mentioned a couple of times already is Parkinson's. And I'd just like to start off by saying most of us probably know a good deal about the, the certainly the best known national spokesperson for Parkinson's, Michael J. Fox. Uh, and kudos to him for uh, bringing attention to this disease at a national level. Um, but there, like, like these other conditions, there is often a range of Parkinson-like conditions that may not be Parkinson's, in fact, often called Parkinsonism. And uh, I, I mentioned this, my, my own brother, uh, I noticed a, a head tremor about 10 years ago. It's exactly the same today as it was 10 years ago. But my first thought then was, oh my goodness, uh, he's going to have Parkinson's disease. It was a tremor. Many of us have tremors. We notice a thumb, a finger. It does not necessarily mean Parkinson's disease, which is a, a, a distinct entity uh, associated with uh, you know, very specific uh, range of, of symptoms and, and so forth. Um, and, and occasionally uh, as it develops cognitive uh, decline and, and some uh, dementia. But a second topic that we can all talk about as well since we are older and as I referred to the fact that we might have an arthritic knee or hip or maybe our vision isn't quite so good is physical injury. That takes its toll on our brain function if, if we have a physical injury or if we're worried about having an injury. Uh, Dr. Ganser, you want to mention something about protecting ourselves or what we might face in a, in a city of concrete when it comes to injury? <clears throat> well, you know, we all, all want to protect our, our, our brains. And, um, you know, I'm not going to say go out there and get a helmet and, you know, as you're roller skating down the street, because I'm sure most of you have given up roller skating. But, um, but it's good to stay active and it's good to um, know our limitations. Um, I think what, what the best advice or the you know, is really, in all instances, you know, trauma to the head. We don't want to have trauma to the head. We know that when we have trauma to any part of our brain, um, the factors, uh, or amyloid gets released in our brain. And that is one of the precursors or one of the, the disease-like uh, symptoms, um, excuse me, the uh, particles that are, are in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. So we really want to be careful with our, um, our gait. You know, make sure that your homes are safe. Uh, make sure you don't have scatter rugs on the floor, which are the little mats, because it's easy to trip and fall in the nighttime when it's dark. Um, it's easy to slip and fall in the bathtub. So make sure you've got those... Um, nice secure uh, hand railings on the side of the showers because you need to be able to grab onto something should you slip. Um, many times I've had patients come in and they said, oh, you know, I was disoriented, it was nighttime, and I, I went to the bathroom and they slip and they fall and they come in, lo and behold, with this you know, huge golf ball size welt on their brain. Well, that causes injury to the brain and then we've got some residual effects of that injury, okay? So um, crossing the streets, you know, how many times do you hear older adults that get, I hate to say it, but run over by taxi cabs in the city, um, you know, we're trying to make the light. As we get older, you know, we slow down a little bit. We start to slow down. So I would heed the, the, the crosswalk sign, you know, and. Uh, Try and go out when things aren't quite as busy. You know, you're in that big crowd and they're pushing and shoving. You, know, you want to be able to, to get out there, but I, I would also worry that um, 
you know, you don't want to put yourself in a situation that's not comfortable. So really just to protect yourself. And, you know, as we get older, our balance is not quite the way it used to be. And sometimes, you know, we lose our balance a little faster and than a younger person and then we fall. Um, so, um, you know, those are just things to think about, you know. Moving, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just, just a couple of points I want to make. Uh, yeah, I, I'm very much looking forward to getting to the successful aging part of the uh, day, uh, but I can't help but throw in a little advertisement here because the big thing that you're worried about, that re really we're worried about is falls. Uh, falls are devastating, and they're certainly way more likely to happen as you get older. But one of the big things you can do to uh, reduce your chance of falls is exercise certain kinds of very careful exercises which improve your balance and improve your strength and make it much less likely you're going to fall. One last uh, plea I would make, again to all of us macho guys, uh, you know, at, some, at a certain point we need to use a cane, we need to use a walker, it's fine. Uh, I think a lot of guys are a little too vain to admit that, but it's much better than falling and breaking your hip. I just want to also mention getting a good pair of shoes a good fitting pair of shoes. I mean, you know, we want to be fashionable, and I, I get it, but a, a good pair of shoes that laces up and, um, and supports your, your ankles, which tend to also start to weaken as we get older. So I would, I would invest in that. All right. We, uh, we are going to move on to uh, how you all have probably... Uh, had your own successful aging, how we try to, and, and maybe some new things that you haven't yet tried. Um, and I'm going to run through just a very quick little litany of kinds of things that, that you can expect to hear. We know most of this already. Obviously, good nutrition, sleeping, uh, exercise. These are almost cliches that you uh, hear about on everywhere uh, for all ages, by the way, not merely older people. Um, but there are some more subtle and maybe more esoteric aspects of uh, our, our blood flow, our, our vascular health. And uh, these are the topics that our experts are going to now go on to. What can we do to really keep our health at a, at a maximum, at, a, at an optimal level as we age? So we're into successful. We are. Okay. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, I just want to... Talking to the <laughs> choir here. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to just explain a little bit about the background of, of why, what we'll be talking about and where, the, where this evidence comes from that what we're saying is actually going to be useful. Uh, and this goes back to, to studies uh, in the uh, basically late 70s and early 80s uh, in which uh, my former mentor Jack Rowe was very prominent in developing this concept of successful aging. But since it was going to be a scientific topic, it had to be, it had to be defined in a very precise way so that we could figure out what's the best way to, to get to that point. And to, to make kind of a long story short, the final uh, sort of criterion, the main criterion for successful aging is to be able to live independently. And that's, I think, probably was not a bad idea because that's sort of the thing that we all fear the most is becoming dependent uh, and, and basically having to rely on other people. It's a really a, a major loss of our sense of self and, and we kind of feel guilty about it. So, uh, you know, we, we'll talk about a lot of, fa well, four main factors that, uh, that were found in those many, many studies that clearly predicted uh, a longer independent life, uh, but in general, that's, that's a really good indicator that you're living the life you, the kind of life you want to live. So um, if, that's, if you don't think independent living is your main criterion, I think you'll find that that's highly associated with the things that really are your goals. So what are these four main things? We've got... Okay. <laughs> All right. You, you uh, so, introduced us to it. Uh, all right, fine. So um, the the four main uh, uh, the four main predictors, and now there are intervention studies that prove that these really do work, are um, uh, exercise. But I mean, this isn't going hitting the gym. This is actually just moderate exercise, doing just sort of normal things around the house. Vacuum cleaning is something that I really recommend. But that kind of thing. Uh, dancing is also very good. 
uh, things that get your the heart up a little bit, but doesn't, doesn't necessarily make you pass out from fatigue. Uh, the second thing is keeping your brain engaged. Uh, and that means uh, all the things that we were talking about today. Uh, but, but probably the most important thing is, is maintaining an interest in life, doing things that are fun and exciting, uh, and doing different things, as was already mentioned. Um, and learning new things is the best thing you can do. Um, and, you know, read. Continue to read. So, or, or start reading if you have, haven't been doing it before. Uh, and the, the third thing is social engagement. Uh, and uh, that's really uh, much more important than you might think in lots of practical ways, but it seems to have some mysterious effect that we don't really understand on maintaining that emotional health, uh, which is kind of the opposite of depression, and, and gives you the excitement that makes you want to maintain your engagement. And the last thing is, uh, is a, little bit, um, a little bit hard to understand, but it's, it's it's called self-efficacy. And it has something to do with um, basically feeling like you, you can get done what you want to get done. It's a little different from self-confidence, uh, and it's a little bit different uh, from just uh, you know, knowing that you've got certain skills. It's a kind of an internal uh, personality trait, but it can be developed. And one of the best ways of developing is doing these activities which give you uh, confidence that you, that you really can, uh, you know, yes we can kind of a thing. Now there's a lot of other related um, uh, things that you can do that, that, that really do, uh, you know, that are, but, but the, these, basically these are the four kind of bottom line things. Now again, th th well, yeah, for example, I didn't really mention nutrition. And I'm a nutritionist, so you would think I would make, and I study dietary restriction. But the truth is, within reasonable bounds, uh, and I think most, uh, actually as people get older, they tend to get a lot more reasonable about their diets. Uh, then, then, you know, you don't really have to go on a strict diet of any kind uh, as long as you're reasonable. And, and that did not really come up, strangely enough, as one of the main predictors of successful aging. So keep it within bounds, but actually, I, just, I do have to say one thing. Um, as you get older about nutrition, as you get older, actually, you don't want to be too thin. And I know people think oh, you can't be too thin. Actually, you can be too thin as you get older. Uh, that actually being, uh, having a, a actually somewhat increased uh, adiposity or body mass index is actually protective in terms of mortality. And we don't really entirely understand that why that is, but it's, pretty cl it's a very robust phenomenon. So, n you know, as you get older, it's not the time to go on a diet. Uh, I mean, unless you're really, you know, obese. And, but that becomes less and less likely as you get older. Um, okay, well, let's maybe go into some depth into uh, each of these. They're the, the essence of staying sharp, really, <coughs> exercise, uh, maybe, you know, nutrition within bounds, uh, social engagement. You know, th the words sound good, but let's face it, you know, friends move away, uh, we're not as energetic, uh, maybe we're losing some friends uh, who have died. Uh, or so social engagement isn't, isn't always easy, certainly isn't as easy as it is when you first show up at your dormitory at uh, 17 years old as a new college student, then it's uh, an hour and you're socially engaged. Well, it's a lot harder for, for most of us. Um, what, what does one do to stay socially engaged? What kind of engagements are there for uh, people as they get older? Um, I think that it's defined individually. Uh, what is socially engaging for one person is completely socially unengaging for another person. So what, what turns you on? What makes you happy? What, what do you want to get out of your day? What do you want to get out of, you know, what are your goals? What makes you feel good inside? And I think that has a lot to do with our mood. You know, it, it, it helps us improve our mood if we're doing the kinds of things um, that make us happy. Uh, there's a lot to be said about happiness. So if you enjoy going to the museums, great, go to the museums. Uh, if you like book clubs, book, book clubs. 
Discussing things in a group help you stay socially engaged. Um, if you're more interested in doing solitary kinds of activities, maybe you like gardening. So you go out and you join a gardening club. You can still be socially engaged in that gardening club, but you're still doing your own thing. Or you like knitting, knit in groups. Knitting is becoming quite popular these days. I mean, I can remember it was very popular and then it dropped off and now there are knitting clubs all over the city. So things that, movies, you know, go to the movies with friends, go out for coffee afterwards, talk about it. So it's very, very individual. But as long as it is something that you enjoy, um, that you enjoy doing. Uh, yeah, I, 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 let me just amplify that point because I, I think it's a good, it's a good point. Um, I think a lot of us consider that growing old uh, has a lot of challenges, and it's certainly true, but it also actually has a lot of advantages, believe it or not. Uh, and one of those is now is the time to really indulge yourself. Probably as you have uh, lived uh, most of your life, you've sacrificed a lot of things for your children, you've had a job that you didn't really like, you, you had to save money, you know, you lived somewhere you didn't like. Hey, you're retired, go for it. Just do what is fun. Uh, and try to lose those, uh, to some extent, those restraints that you have placed on you uh, when you were younger. Uh, but on the other hand, with respect to all of these things, to tell you the truth, social, I'm an introvert, so I have to kind of really push myself to socialize, uh, but I do. I push myself, and because really, wouldn't you rather just stay home? I would. But, you know, I, uh, I push myself to go out, and I'm always glad I did. But it's, it does take a little bit of, it, it takes a certain amount of willpower, actually, to do that. Same with exercise, and uh, hopefully not the same with reading and learning. But maybe for some people, my daughter, definitely. That takes a lot of willpower on her part to, to read a book. Uh, so we all have things that we sort of enjoy more than others. And what we're trying to do here is to uh, encourage you and give you some evidence that if you just push yourself a little bit, it'll have really great uh, returns in terms of how successful you are uh, during aging. You know, I, I would like to argue in favor of uh, using the internet. I've, maybe other people have done this already for you. Um, the internet, there's an article about the internet every day in the newspaper and might say nine times out of 10, it's critical. It's uh, leading to bullying or it's uh, isolating. It doesn't allow face-to-face -face contact. Well, it's amazing that it allows far more than you, you might think. And if you're not a, an active computer user, I'd say get involved with that. I happen, this is a true story, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I uh, uh, signed up for a course at the Museum of Modern Art. It's exclusively on the internet. Hmm. I'm not going down to MoMA. Well, it turns out people on this course are from Sydney, Australia, Mexico, uh, Albuquerque, I think I'm the only one in the city who's taking this course. But here we are talking to people. I'm talking to people. One person is from Spain. And we are socially engaged. It's a, it's a little bit different than sitting in a room and knitting together or doing something like that. But it's incredibly engaging. And there are videos on the, on the course. Uh, happen to be done, a little plug here, by two graduate students, doctoral students at the City University of New York. Uh, and uh, they hold little coffee conversations on the internet that you can uh, flash back and forth. I, a lot of my friends uh, I keep in touch with by email, an uh, uh, old girlfriend who lives in Houston. I haven't seen her in decades. Uh, people in California. Uh, a lot of uh, people our age are on Facebook. It's not my thing to get to the personal uh, taste, but it is for many to get, stay in touch with their grandchildren who might be in Oklahoma, who knows where. Uh, it's a good thing. It can be a great thing to keep you socially involved. Even emailing people in the city who you might not necessarily have time to talk to on the phone. Um, so I, I am an advocate for that. So there are, an, the, the, the variety of social engagements is almost limitless. One of the other things that, the, we were talking about before, we're all faculty. Getting involved with young people is fantastic. 
I would say it keeps faculty going. It's one of the reasons retirement age is so high uh, for faculty. Um, it, they are, they do nothing but look forward. You know, talk about, it's a strategy for old people. Don't look back all the time. Don't reminisce uh, about your uh, teenage years back in the 40s, the 50s. You know, look forward, be engaged with the future. Well, that's all they do. And it, it can be very uplifting and thrilling. If you're not a teacher or a faculty member, and how many people can be, uh, there are volunteer, uh, they're begging for people to volunteer in schools and helping young people. And goodness knows they often need and adore the involvement of an older person in their lives. It's, I think, one of the most rewarding things I have ever heard retired people talk about is an engagement with uh, high school students, with grade school students, obnoxious as they can be, and they can be. One-on-one, uh, -on -one, they are often just delightful and uplifting in a way nothing else can be. Uh, that was my, my, my two-bit contribution to this. I don't consider myself an expert on that, but I did want to want to uh, uh, get that out. Um, what about uh, other engagements? I have a, a, a relative who is a Parkinson's patient. And uh, by virtue of my contact with that group, I was asked to participate in a clinical study as a control person. Mm -hmm. How odd. I had never thought of myself that way. But uh, are, are there um, uh, clinical uh, involvements that older people can get, uh, can associate with? Absolutely. Um, we live in such a great city here, and there are um, so many uh, major medical centers, uh, Mount Sinai being one of them. Uh, Cornell uh, has a very close relationship with Hunter College, uh, while Cornell, uh, NYU, um, Columbia, all of these uh, medical centers uh, sponsor either uh, through the government um, or through private um, organizations, uh, foundations, clinical trials, uh, research studies. And they're looking for uh, normal, healthy, um, older adults, ages 50 and over, to participate. And you are so valuable to the research that is being done and uh, you are just so, such an integral part of, of getting the, the word out you know, to your, your friends about participating in uh, clinical trials. A lot of these clinical trials um, are looking at some of the issues that we talked about here this afternoon. Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, depression studies, um, drug studies, trying to um, bring to market products that are, um, you know, needed to help with a lot of these disease processes. And we can't do it without uh, normal, healthy volunteers uh, as a control, as, a, as the control. So, um, you know, even cancer studies at Sloan Kettering, uh, I would always uh, I recommend, um, you know, looking in the newspaper, listening to radio stations like NPR, um, that that do public service announcements of these kinds of opportunities. And sometimes they even give a little incentive. You know, maybe they send you off with a gift card or a little, um, you know, something uh, to, uh, they'll pay your travel, you might get a free medical exam, something like that. So think about it. I just, I'd just like to, to confirm that. I learned when I participated in this study over at uh, New York Hospital, that it's the healthy controls that are hard to find. Yes. And, and yet most of us, if we have any friends or relatives who, who are ill in one way or another, who need to go to the doctor, we often accompany them. And we sit there and read a magazine while they go to the doctor and, and, and the doctor is, is engaging with a person who is, is medically in need, when a perfectly healthy person who could participate in a study is sitting out there doing nothing. And it, it, it requires just a small step. Gee, are you involved with any studies? Do you know of any studies? I can volunteer. Absolutely. Um, 
You know, a lot of the um, Alzheimer's disease and memory disorder clinics here in the city are looking for normal controls so that they can compare, you know, your normal aging and how your brain is normally aging as compared to someone who's not. They may ask you to participate in a, um, an MRI study where they'll actually, you know, do an MRI of your brain and they want to look yes. at why is it that your brain looks this way and an Alzheimer's disease is looking in a different way or um, you know most most of the studies are, are non-invasive you know and, and I you know those are uh, studies that I would definitely encourage you to participate in um, if, if you have any interest at all uh, yeah well that just a, just a uh, absolutely right about that uh, this is also true by the way uh, for post-mortem tissue and so uh, not to get, you know, uh, morbid or anything, uh, but uh, something to keep in mind is uh, certainly my wife and I uh, plan to donate our uh, body uh, to Mount Sinai to be used for uh, control tissue uh, because that's really very hard to come by. And once, once we're gone, you know, we don't have any use for it. So uh, just uh, something to keep in mind as a kind of a public uh, service. We're going to move on to some questions, which I, I hope you've been formulating. But before we do, I'd like to ask each of you uh, for a singular bit of advice on successful aging. Maybe your favorite or, or the first thing that comes to your mind is an important bit of advice. I think whatever you're going to do uh, and whatever takeaway message you, you get from, from this afternoon, you know, um, it's not just one thing. It's a combination of things that we do in our lives that lead to successful aging. So it's not just doing the exercise or engaging in the leisure activities or being socially engaged or eating healthy. And I'm a big advocate for eating healthy and you know that's something that you're really involved in. But it's a combination of these factors over time if you adhere to these kinds of practices over time, that, in my opinion, will lead you on the path to really a successfully um, achieving, you know, health and wellness. Well, I guess the one, I, I completely agree with everything that was said, and the, I guess my one little thing I would add is go out and educate yourself. Uh, about successful aging. There's lots of books out there. The Dana Foundation has lots of literature on it. Uh, and it will help you find the path that's best for you and also uh, gives you ammunition to argue with those young whippersnappers who are telling you what to do uh, because they're not going to do it. Um, so there's an old word for you, right? It's one I heard when I was a little kid, but it's uh, still uh, perfectly valid. Um, we would like to open this up for questions. Uh, there's one uh, limitation, and it's that although we, could, we might call this Ask the Doctor, uh, but please don't say I've got a pain here in my side. This is not about uh, a personal visit to the physician, uh, but rather uh, try to formulate your question so that it is going to be of general uh, interest to the audience. There's a gentleman out there who had his hand up first. And uh, Chris Kane, a uh, postdoctoral fellow here at Hunter, is going to help us out. And uh, Chris, if you could also be eyes as well as ears for hands. What do you do with uh, people, um, this is a person who's 75 years old, whose hearing is going and absolutely refuses to get fitted for, for a hearing aid? This is your, your problem. <laughs> Okay, so what is their main concern? They don't, want, they don't want to be embarrassed by having somebody see that they actually can't hear. I mean, and that's really the bottom line. They, they, are they have these hearing aids, you know, that go inside. Yeah, I don't know they, the, techni the technical data, they but he still refuses to do that also. I think it's, uh, this is a personal opinion. He refuses to admit he's getting older. <laughs> that, that very well may be. And, uh, you know, the tiny little hearing devices that you insert inside your ear that are virtually invisible are very difficult. And I'm sure some of you might be able to, to 
agree with me, to manipulate. When you are older, you have difficulties sometimes with dexterity. And to put that little tiny hearing aid inside your ear is often very difficult. Um, you know what? Let it go. You don't want to cause yourself stress. Is it that big of a deal? In your, is it that big of a deal in your family? No, it's not that big a deal. Okay, so then I think to keep your stress level down and uh, just make sure that they can hear when they're crossing the street and you know, maybe get a, uh, an adapter for the telephone. Uh, well, I, I agree, definitely. You don't want to uh, stress yourself out. Uh, but I would say uh, for the people in this room, uh, that might be having doubts about the value of hearing aids, uh, there are two really, really good reasons uh, that you should, uh, you should make sure your hearing is as, is as good as it can be. The well, first point I want to make is that hearing loss is virtually universal. It's going to happen to all of us if we live long enough. In contrast to Alzheimer's disease, that's not true. Uh, but it's certainly true that hearing loss is universal. And the biggest problem is it becomes socially isolating. And that's one of the big no-nos for successful aging. So that would be a really good example of a situation of where you don't want to do it, it, it you basically, but you, you force yourself to do it, just like me going out and talking to people, because it really is going to be good for you and the people that depend on you. Yes. Uh, how beneficial is it to, uh, to set aside each day for meditation a few day, uh, minutes out of the day? Yeah, I'll, st I'll restate the question. This is one of my favorite topics, and, and I would like to hear you. Uh, okay, the, the question is how beneficial is meditation? And I, and I should have thought of that when we were talking about the, how to deal with stress. Um, there are many studies that have de demonstrated uh, that, that meditation is really very, very uh, helpful and beneficial. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a personally a big believer in it. I, I meditate myself. And uh, there are many kinds of meditations that, uh, that you can use, and probably it doesn't matter what, which one it is. But um, as you get, and, and one of the most robust effects of meditation, and it really is very robust, is for stress, stress effects. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, I actually started meditating because I, I had asthma as a child, and I thought it might help um, that, and it really did. Now, that might have been a placebo effect to some extent, but there have been MRI studies and hormonal studies and all kinds of objective uh, evidence that meditation uh, is really been, ha has a lot of health and emotional benefits. I'd, I'd just like to mention placebo effect is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's a psychophysiological reaction to wishful thinking. Who knows? Uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, Chris, you've got the, the next. Okay. Um, you've mentioned all these things that you think will help us. Does this help if you have a gene for Alzheimer's? Yeah, yeah I'll repeat the question. This is a great question. Um, the, the question is, what if you already have a gene for Alzheimer's disease, um, then do all these things help? Well, uh, first of all, I, I, I'm glad you asked that question. I would like to point out that what we've been talking about here today is, uh, at least in the last part of this, of this discussion, is about successful aging. And that has a particular, as I've said, sort of technical meaning having to do with independence. And Basically, nothing can alter the course of Alzheimer's disease. So if you have Alzheimer's disease, uh, you're not going to prevent it. But even if you do have Alzheimer's disease, uh, these uh, interventions will still help you cope with that Alzheimer's disease better. Uh, the same thing is true for other diseases. For example, multiple sclerosis. Now, Exercise does not stop the progression of multiple sclerosis, but it allows you to function much better if you have multiple sclerosis. So the same thing is true for Alzheimer's disease. Now, with respect to Alzheimer's disease and genes, I, I should point out, though, that uh, although Alzheimer's disease, disease has a relatively high heritability, meaning 
if, you're an, if you have an identical twin, there's about a 50% chance you'll get the disease. But still, 50% chance you won't. And we don't really understand what those factors are. So bottom line is, uh, it, to be perfectly honest, you're not going to stop the g disease progression with any in known intervention. But you will certainly function better if you do uh, these practices. Hi, I have a few questions. One, the issue of balance and the issue of, you know, slowing down, walking slower, what, what causes that and is there anything to, um, I don't want to remediate it, uh, you know, reverse it. Uh, the second is healthy vitamins vitamins that are good for the brain. And the third question I have has to do with the facilities like Mount Sinai or New York Hospital. What's available for this neighborhood for people to go in? You know, if, if one wants to have a consultation and say, hey, you know, I'm synapsing slowly, <laughs> or, you know, what do you have for me? I mean, I've had short-term memory loss my whole life. I happen to have ADD. I'll be 75 in June. And I work, you know, at least 20 hours a week. I volunteer. I'm a first responder. Thank you, Hunter, for being, this is the place. If anybody lives in this neighborhood and you got to respond to a place to be secure, here's where you come. So, um, uh, all the factors that you mentioned, I have in my life, but uh, except for, I notice balance and walking, that I am much slower than I used to be and don't have the muscle strength in my lower body. Thank you very much. Okay, I can answer a couple of the questions, um, then I'll can pass it over to you. Um, there is an aging center at Cornell Weill, and you can go there, and um, they have a fabulous geri gerontology or geriatric um, department, uh, and the physicians that are uh, on staff there are excellent uh, and very well trained and knowledgeable about issues that are specific to the aging process. So um, you have some a place right in your in your backyard here. I'd like to also thank you for mentioning. Uh, I know that Hunter really um, uh, opened their doors to the community during Hurricane Sandy, and I know a lot of people uh, came here, so um, including myself. So I, I, I know exactly um, what a great place this is. Um, you spoke about vitamins uh, and nutritional supplements. Um, there are quite a few things that you could do uh, I'm a big fan of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, I, uh, I always recommend, if at all possible, to get a prescription for what's called Lovaza or Lovaza, which is um, a pharmaceutical grade omega-3 uh, fatty acid. And um, it really does help, and it's in the literature. Uh, it, it is not uh, prescribed as a neuroprotective agent. It's actually prescribed as a uh, an agent to lower triglycerides, but anything that lowers your uh, risk for high cholesterol um, certainly is uh, something that I would advocate. Um, and all of those good monounsaturated fats that we should be eating in our diet, like avocados that are rich in all of those kinds of um, nutrients, are brain protective. You know, we heard a lot about the Mediterranean diet, and I'm sure you could speak to that and um, uh, olive oil in particular you know, is, is good. Um, beta carotene is excellent. So, um, and I'll let you talk. Well, I, I think you covered the nutrition pretty well. Yeah. And so, uh, I, although I, I am a nutritionist, but even though I'm a nutritionist, I'm a really big believer in exercise. And there are, exer there are I, I, by the way, I congratulate you on your wonderful poster child lifestyle for the successful ager, and that's awesome. Uh, and, uh, but I would say, uh, though it sounds like you have a very active life, in truth, uh, there are exercises that are particularly good for balance and lower body strength. And I would like to emphasize, 
you know, absolutely what you said is correct. Uh, the mu loss of muscle mass is a, one of the most robust phenomena in aging. Happens to all animals, happens to all people, happens to athletes. Uh, but uh, you, can, you can really protect yourself a, a lot against the effects of loss of muscle mass by particular exercises. So, so for example, I go to a gym and, uh, and I, I had learned some uh, exercises from my personal trainer that are not they're not strength exercises, and they're not um, cardiovascular. They're specifically for balance. And uh, you've got to sort of dedicate yourself to those particular kinds of exercises. Uh, but, you know, so in other words, there's a, I, I would say things having to do with physical um, impairments, like uh, balance and walking more slowly and feeling weaker, that is probably amenable to intervention more than anything else we've talked about. Uh, so, you just need to get special exercises for that. I, I'd, like, I'd like to add one thing about this because I was listening very intently. We happen to be very fortunate living in New York City, which is a walking city. Right. You have an opportunity. We all do. I walk to work. I'm very, very lucky. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yet, I see students get on the elevator here at Hunter and take the elevator from the first floor to the second floor. Right. I can't stand Absolutely. it. It drives me crazy. These are young, healthy people but not for long. <laughs> we can walk, uh, and, and if there's an opportunity to walk, whether it's, uh, if you're from the general area, whether it's into the park, up a, a small flight of stairs. Uh, that's both helpful for balance and modest strength improvement and reflexes. Don't necessarily walk downstairs if you can help it, but walking up is, is very valuable and walking an extra block, doing things like that is, is good. Uh, I think, no, we, we we're following the, the bouncing microphone. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if you can hear this, but thank you. It, it sort of followed along that trajectory. Um, I have vertigo, and I have the kind of vertigo that disabling, and, you know, I, I fall. Uh, and as you talk about exercise, I, I, I want to put a plug in for number one, uh, if, you really, if you feel dizzy, uh, you really need to be checked out because um, this is something that doesn't just come from aging. In my case, it came from uh, massive infection and then also being allergic to half the medication I take because, you know, you can have massive doses of antibiotics to try to clear up a mouth infection, ear infection, and then this can be the aftermath. But the other part is you could talk about exercise, but as you say, rehabilitation from uh, the best way to learn if you really suffer from any kind of dizziness weakness, falling, is to really to get physical therapy. I ended up at Russ for six months to learn how to walk again. And it's very different than your average exercise. And I go to the Y, but they could not teach me how to really keep, prevent the falling and to really learn. And, um, you know, you can get physical therapy, whether you have insurance coverage or not, if you really have a serious thing. And a lot of people suffer this dizziness. It can lead to loss of hearing. And um, just getting a cane or a walker is not as protective as really learn getting some physical therapy and learning how to fall even. I was taught how yes. to fall, how to get up, uh, and how to protect myself, because I don't think I'd still be here if I didn't get that kind of training. And it can happen as early as your 50s to, the, to get that kind of training. Uh, so exercise is different than physical therapy. Right. So I, I just want to put a plug in for that. Good. Thank you. Uh, Chris, who's next? Who do you have? We're right here. Okay. Great. Um, how true is it that a quarter of teaspoon of cinnamon a day would prevent diabetes and Alzheimer? What what would what? Oh, you heard that cinnamon would prevent diabetes and Alzheimer. Any comment? <laughs> Actually, there there are some studies that cinnamon um, is beneficial to the brain and to preventing um, uh, dementia-like syndromes. I mean, it's it's anecdotal for the most part. I mean, there are long-term studies, but um, there are studies on turmeric, for instance. Uh, turmeric is also considered to be a very uh, healthy uh, product to be consuming um, in certain populations. You know, in the Indian uh, cultures, uh, they eat a lot of turmeric. If you're not familiar, it's a it's a root vegetable. Uh, it's a root, and it's um, it gets uh, powdered and it's yellow, 
It looks yellow. Right, very much so. Turmeric, yeah. Put in milk at night before you go to bed. He said, put the turmeric in uh, what type of milk? Not rice milk, the other one. Almond milk Almond with milk. a little bit of honey each night before you retire. He said a lot of Indian people do that and don't suffer from dementia. Okay. I also wanted to say one quick thing. There's a class at the, y, the there's a class at the Y called Silver Sneakers that addresses issues such as falling and promoting balance yes. among seniors. Mm-hmm. Silver, it's at called Silver YMCA. Sneakers at the YMCA. Okay. I think there's a lady in the back. Silver sneakers. Silver sneakers at the Y. Chris, you you get in the back. Can you hear me? Somewhere around. Okay, silver sneakers at the YMCA. Hi, thank you very much. It was interesting, and thank you for reassuring me that I can continue to lose at the game of memory with my grandchildren. Uh, I thought it was my focus, and I'd like you to say something about focus and and aging how that has that that's affected thank you uh, th- yeah thank you for bringing that up uh, what, we, what we usually talk about is attention and um, and attention definitely is uh, impaired with age and the, the part of the brain that uh, primarily supports attention the prefrontal cortex uh, becomes somewhat less engaged with the rest of the brain which can uh, be somewhat problematic. So uh, we don't really know. I, I mean, you're, and you're right that part of the problems with memory could be just uh, that kind of loss of attention. Um, I don't know, though, that there's anything that uh, I, I'm not aware of any particular um, exercise that uh, enhances attention. Maybe, maybe you know, I, I don't know. But I think it's a real possibility, and, and I guess. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a question of probably just being aware of it as a possibility. And, and uh, for example, um, reducing the potential, ex- uh, ex- the word I'm looking for here. Well, that's on the tip of your tongue? Distractions. Uh, you know, that, so that's definitely, and by the way, that also, uh, that also applies to a number of related circumstances. For example, as we said earlier, hearing is universally impaired with age. Uh, In addition to the physical impairment, um, it becomes more difficult to make out specific words in a loud room. Probably we've all experienced that. So uh, what it means is one of the ways of dealing with that is is just try to reduce the number of potential uh, distracting noises. Uh, maybe turn off the radio when you're really trying to focus on something, something, something along those lines. But it is a very valid point. You know, uh, Dr. Ganser uh, addressed uh, aspects of attention without necessarily uh, pointing to attention when she mentioned try something new. One of the ways that attention is activated is with, with uh, novelty, whether it's a new language, whether it's uh, a new exercise. One of the things that actually physical therapists and trainers know very well is that when you're doing the same old exercises day in and day out, you lose interest, you lose attention, you lose focus, and the exercises lose their efficacy. So new exercises, new uh, uh, travel, walking a different route if you have a a walking route, uh, uh, that does focus you by changing and exciting your uh, attention. Now, whether that translates over into the rest of your life, to some extent, no doubt it does. But it certainly activates, keeps it active for the time being. And that's something that a lot of people don't do when they just go, well, this is the same route I always took. I know it, and I'm not going to change. That's the last thing you want to do, is keep the old style and not try something new. Um, I just want to mention one thing. Uh, uh, This past summer at the International Alzheimer's uh, Conference, uh, one of the, the presenters um, did a study on ballroom dancing uh, and, and the benefits of uh, older adults engaging in ballroom dancing. So if you are interested at all in going back to the 50s and <laughs> doing ballroom dancing, by all means, you know, there are places here in our city that would actually support that. And, and it's very, very beneficial to um, successful brain aging. Uh, Chris, who's got this? Oh, here we go. Um, My question, uh, uh, 
you, this goes back to just an earlier discussion that the woman mentioned about the Rusk Institute, which they also mentioned at the Staying Sharp conference on Wednesday, because apparently they have something called GATE training, and in my head I thought G-A-T-E, but it's G-A-I-T. And for people who need help with balance, they said that, that they recommended it. I wondered if that was that you needed a prescription because Rusk is a hospital after all. And yeah. if one, and then there must be a cost involved, are there places where you can get that kind of physical therapy or the kind of aging exercises that are less expensive? Settlement houses are, you know, in are there places to go if you don't have the wherewithal to pay for expensive treatment? Y Thank you. You can, you can definitely get a prescription from your physician. If you are complaining about any kind of a disorder, whether it's your balance, and many times uh, I write a prescription out for a patient to go for um, physical therapy, uh, for gait, what we call gait retraining, and um, and so they go in, they get evaluated, and then the physical therapist will call and say, okay, these are the kinds of things I'm going to do in order to re-strengthen um, this individual. Absolutely. And it's also, you know, we do that also for um, memory impairment. We, 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 you know, we, we can send you um, to places where you can get training, if, like what I said before, the programs. And sometimes insurance companies will pay for these things. Um, I've had a patient that I wrote a prescription for the Cognifit program and they submitted it with the bill and the bill was like $600 and they got 80% back. So it depends on your individual insurance carrier. Community centers are the yeah, best bet. I mean, as far as free and low cost kinds of programs, you know, those I'm not familiar with anything like that. Perhaps, you know, if you look into the YMCA, you know, here on the 96th Street Y, mm -hmm. they sometimes run programs um, that might... Absolutely, absolutely. Maybe you found a niche market that no one's interested in at the moment. Thank you all. I appreciate the, the talking here. I want to talk about opposites. At the same time, I'm 63, I notice not a market level, but somewhat... I want to express something. I have all the definitions of the phrase or the word, and it's on the tip of the tongue. It might come into my head in 10 minutes when I wake up the next day. Yet at the same time, and I've had this for as long as I can remember, I can remember bank accounts from 30 years ago, phone numbers, um, old jokes my father told, and things that I haven't talked about in ages. And I kind of want to get an idea. Is this a good sign? Should I feel it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, yeah, I, I, this is absolutely universal. Uh, that, that basically memories that were laid down early on, and we, we all, I'm sure, have exactly the same experience. Uh, it's amazing what you can remember, what you learned. Uh, my wife and I, as I say, we, uh, we do community theater, so we learn a lot of new songs for a show, and then it's gone the next week, completely gone. But Songs we learned in our teens, uh, the crazy songs from the television shows, you know, Gilligan's Island, all that stuff. We remember every word of that. Exactly. So uh, it's just one of those um, kind of amusing and uh, somewhat a frustrating phenomena, but it's, uh, it's a very well-established phenomenon. So welcome to the club. It's also, I'm a, I'm a full-time musician, and I plan on staying that way. And it, it kind of amazed me, I, I'm a trombonist, but I play piano as well, how many songs that I never tried to learn, I could just sit down and play. So, I mean, I've, I've understand that being a musician, I'm also very much into mathematics and arithmetic. I feel like my brain is pretty sharp. Those frustrating moments, though, when someone has to fill in the gaps, I'm just, I'm really, actually, I'm, I'm at the point where I just want to be very proactive. I have a, I just got married a couple of years ago to someone 15 years younger, and I definitely well, want to keep good, up. That's a good that's one. That's a good one. <laughs> the, the meaning of proactive. Uh, right. Not amateur, but pro, right? Well, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Hi. <laughs> I'm 
laughing at them. Hi, and thank you very much for the presentation. It was very, very interesting. Kind of um, close to the subject that he was talking about, very often I find that um, I'm talking to someone and I'm trying to think of a word. I can think of the description. I can describe it to you, but the word itself just won't come. And is there any way to compensate for that? Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I would say yes. And uh, I, I say this because, and it's one of the things, uh, as, as Dr. Mob said earlier, you know, we, we forgot things when we were in our 20s. Just nobody pays attention to that forgetfulness. Everyone's focused on our forgetfulness. One of the ways that words come back is by context. And uh, if you're certainly if you're with someone and you're describing uh, a context, as you say, you describe whatever it is, um, you can, might get sort of like uh, what's the, the game uh, uh, charade. Somebody will uh, cue you and the word will come back. So context is extremely important for remembering almost everything and particularly vocabulary words uh, without context. Uh, it's very hard to learn those words in the first place, and it's exceptionally hard to remember them without the context. So just remember, now w this is part of, what, what was it? It was that book I read, it was that movie, it was the newspaper article. Ask yourself these questions if no one's there to ask them of you. And uh, oh yeah, it had to do with uh, that, that news item on uh, you know, the fire in Queens, and it, it, that really does help it come back. Yeah, I'll just mention making associations is really yes, what, you know, what that's is. really the way I try to remember things. A game that sometimes you can play to help remember is to associate whatever it is with something familiar. So uh, one individual decided to uh, associate words with furniture in their living room and they go around and they go back to that piece of furniture and that's the cue or the stimulus that brings back that memory that that you're looking for that's stored way back. So it's, it's that association, um, oh, that person's face, you know, it reminds me of um, an apple because it's round, you know, and you look at it and you remember, oh, yeah, it was an apple. Oh, right, her name was Amelia, you know, so things of that nature. You know, there's, there's this, speaking of your uh, question and probably some one we've, uh, many of us have read is uh, Oliver Sacks' various books on, on uh, neuroscience and neurological problems and he himself suffers from and has written about this condition prosopagnosia uh, and uh, the man who mistook his wife for a hat and one of the things that uh, uh, people do is associate clothing with the identity of a person or a gait, how they walk. Uh, many people are walking around not recognizing faces very well and goodness knows if an individual changes clothes dramatically, they may not be recognized. But, but uh, normally we do associate. We are not often aware of it, but it is a key way in which we keep our minds sharp is to try to be aware that we're associating clothing with a person or sounds with a, 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 you know, a, music, uh, a musical composer or something, uh, context association. Chris, where are you? Uh, I just want to say walking is wonderful exercise. However, in New York City, you really need to be very careful of the curb cuts. I yes. caught my leg on the higher part of one, stepped on the lower part, and knocked my head off the apex of my spine. The <laughs> ambu an ambulance driver said that another woman he picked up broke both her wrists. And two weeks ago, a friend of mine fell and died. So... Walking can be very, very hazardous, and you have to be really careful. And actually, the curb cups all need to be redone so that they're not so hazardous. Wow. She said that the curb cuts in the city along the, the edge, edges of the corners are, are of various heights. And so it's very important that as we are stepping down or stepping up, you can trip up or you can trip down. And, you know, you can really fall and hurt yourself, and, and several people have, and including this lady. Chris? Okay. I just want to say I'm also a big uh, proponent of cycling, and you can buy little 
30, for $30 from Amazon, a little metal frame with two pedals on it where you can sit down and just cycle. One of the questions I was going to ask you is, can I get back to biking after traumatic brain injury? <laughs> uh, I, I have a TBI, and I won't go into the details. A couple of questions are just not applicable to the general audience. I found everything quite relevant, and I'm very grateful. Good. Thank you. Hi, again, I thank you also for uh, this afternoon. I am, um, you talked about situational depression, and I wonder if anybody is studying or the effect on older people who are home or often now that we're not working, and the daily onslaught of bad news. It's just, you're just inundated with it, and I think even the newscasters are getting depressed. So, um, but we're, we're bombarded with it, and so what... Turn off the television set. Absolutely. I do that. Absolutely. Uh, I think we can take uh, about three more questions. Is that okay? Uh, let's try to get as many people who have not yet asked. Yes, ma'am. Thank ma you, you three doctors, for this wonderful uh, exchange of ideas. I'm sorry I was late. I bought a, uh, a movie that was that won an award on the Academy, and I was so mesmerized by, I love animals, I work with animals, and that's a suggestion. Get a dog, everyone. Yes. Walk yes. with the dog, or walk yes. with any <laughs> cat. Um, and my dog died recently, so I haven't been able to, I live across the street from a park, from Cultural's Park, and I've not been able, that's a mental thing, I guess, not been able to go to the park for the last few months because of my dog not having a dog, so now I'm in search of uh, a okay. little dog. But it will change my habits because I sleep until 12 noon. I'm a night person. I'm up all night, and uh, so I sleep. Uh, late. Do you have a question for the? the oh, so a question. Now, uh, what do I do about that? That changing my habits, of course, is 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 a thing because I'm going to get a dog, and it's not fair to the dog to have him sleep with me. My guinea pigs sleep well <laughs> with me. That's not okay. a problem. But I would like to can you change know how habits? I can change that habit. The okay. habit of sleeping in? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I would recommend what we call sl uh, sleep hygiene. You know, changing your, your pattern of sleep hygiene. So you're going to have to go to sleep. You're going to have to force yourself to go to sleep at night and get up early in the morning. And it'll happen gradually. And maybe you can do that before you get the dog so the dog doesn't have to worry. But gradually over time, um, you, you can... Um, yeah drink a glass of warm milk in the evening before you go to bed or uh, take the supplement melatonin which helps induce sleep okay okay uh, Chris uh, last couple where are you she's right here okay sorry go ahead is a uh, small vessel disease of the brain a heart condition or a brain condition and would going to the um, Cornell Center for the Aging be a good place to go or see a neurologist? Or what do you suggest? Small, the, the question is, is a small vessel disease a condition of the heart or the brain? Well, it's a combination, okay? It begins with having hypertension. And the hypertension is not being managed properly. My I'm fine with that. I'm bodily fine. I don't have that. Your blood pressure is fine. Yes, I'm low blood pressure. Right, and it's also inherited. Yeah. Um, you might have a, a, a disorder of coagulation of the blood that causes sometimes tiny strokes. And yes, going to Cornell, they have a wonderful neurology department. Okay. Absolutely. And is it called Cornell for the aging? Yeah. Yes, they have neurologists on staff there. Okay. Absolutely. We'll have a last question. Uh, have I think there's a woman there in the blue who has not spoken. Um, a friend of mine told me about a program on Channel 13 at Dr. Neil Bernard, and he has a theory. Uh, he said there's a study, but he didn't go into which study, whose name, whatever, of the effect of high blood pressure and high cholesterol medication, which is causing memory loss. Have you heard of such a study? Because I imagine that uh, I imagine a majority of seniors are on both of those uh, medications. 
I, th I think what they're probably referring to is um, what's called polypharmacy. Uh, polypharmacy is, is the taking of multiple medications um, and the interactions or the, the cross reactions between the different medications. Um, there's something called the, the Beers criteria and uh, it lists what's called potentially inappropriate medications for older adults and uh, it's, it's readily available at your pharmacies. You can go to your pharmacist and discuss it and ask them, you know, I'm on X, Y medicines. Could they be causing me to have um, memory problems or kinds of confusion, most likely? Oh, it's called the, the Beers criteria, Be, like Beers, like B-E-E-R-S criteria. Okay, we actually do have, I think, time for one more question. and. and uh, Chris, is you, uh, yeah. all right, let's go. I don't know if this is a question, or uh, but I thought you might like to know there's an organization in New York City called Health Advocates for Older People. Mm. And the prime focus and uh, of health advocates is to keep people healthy, giving them the skills and the tools that they need to stay at home. So, um, which means that they do things, they have book clubs, they have uh, Tai Chi exercises, they have somebody, a Gracious Homes will go in to evaluate your bathroom and your house, uh, plus they have a, a, a person who does that, an occupational therapist to make sure that it's safe. And you can look at it online, Health Advocates for Older People, it's H-A-F-O-P as in Peter, and it, it does a lot of different things. There are movies, book clubs, lectures, Good All to kinds know. of things. Very good to know. Uh, all right. I think we have come to our end. I want to thank uh, Dr. Ann Ganser, Dr. Charles Mobs, and of course Hunter College and the Dana Institute for Brain Function. Is that right? The Dana Foundation for Brain Initiatives. Yes. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Rodney.